everyone, my name is Allison Strohschein, the storyteller behind Shanti Pox. And this vlog is dedicated to your ninth most powerful action for lasting peace, and that is to heal. And I'm super thrilled and excited to be speaking with Natalie Sudman today. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you, Allison. Natalie wrote an incredible book um, called The Application of Impossible Things. And she writes about an experience she had in Iraq in 2007 where she, her convoy was hit by a roadside bomb and she had a near-death experience, and which, which she chronicles in this incredible book. And so she's going to be talking to us today about the importance of healing and what she did to heal from her a uh, very um, traumatic experience. So Natalie, could you start out by just telling us what happened? Sure. Um, I was out visiting uh, construction sites with some other colleagues and we were in a four vehicle convoy. And this is how we typically traveled off base. It was an armored convoy with armored guards. And on the way back to base, the vehicle that I was traveling in was hit with the roadside bomb. And there were four of us in the vehicle. The, man, the guard sitting in front of me was killed in the attack. And the other three of us were all severely injured. So um, as we were driving down the, the road, I was, I was tired. It was the end of a long day. So I was kind of propped up against the window, you know, with my eyes closed. And, and I didn't hear the explosion. All, it's like, I, I don't know, I left my body before that or whatever. But consciously what I remembered was a pop, like the sound of that Microsoft pop. And, and then I was back in my body, and I, I kind of remembered some things that had happened that I chronicle in the book. But, um, but I kept my eyes closed, and I knew we were still rolling down the road, and I just, I just went, oh, <laughs> God, now I have to deal with this. But I thought, oh, you know, quit whining, just get on with it. So I opened my eyes, and we're still rolling down the road, and I'm inside this charred vehicle. The driver didn't remember, but he must have been conscious enough to steer the truck off the road. So we stopped there on the desert, and the man sitting next to me, as we were rolling down the road, he was he was in a great deal of pain, and he was still conscious, but he passed out then. So I, it seemed like I was the only one conscious, so I thought, well, I better do something. So I tried to lever myself around to sit on the center console between the two front seats and found that my right wrist wasn't working. So, um, and I couldn't see out of my right eye, so I just put my hand up over my eye. And I, I got myself levered around onto, the, onto that console and I looked for, I tried to get the, the medical kit out and couldn't get that out because it was jammed against a guy's legs. And, and as I was sitting there, I was thinking about, um, not being able to see out of my eye. And I thought, I didn't, it's not like I felt around, you know, what's wrong with my eye? I didn't, I didn't think that way. I just thought, well, I wonder if I'll be able to see out of this eye. And as soon as I thought, well, I might be one-eyed for the rest of my life, I got this, this, this feeling of pure thrill. It was like um, absolutely devoid of fear. It was, it was, clean excitement. I was excited for it because I had never experienced that before. Everything would be new to me with wow. one eye. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> and I, had, I also remembered a dream that I had had years before. My grandmother, in the dream, I was walking across the square and my grandmother called out to me. And in, in the physical world, she had died a couple years earlier. So I went over and talked to my grandmother in this dream and she was making these beautiful pictures in my mind. And I said to her, Grandma, oh, she was, in the dream she was blind. So I said, Grandma, how can you do this? How can you make these beautiful pictures in my mind when you're blind? And as soon as I said it, I thought, oh, how stupid is that? And she leaned toward me and she said, Natalie, you don't need eyes to see. And so I remembered this when I was sitting in the truck, you know, one-eyed. I was like, I don't need eyes to see. And I got really, really excited. And I know, I mean, it sounds kind of demented, you know, why would you get excited about losing sight in one eye? But it... 
um, I thought about that a lot later when I was healing because the the power of fear <laughs> is a great blocker, you know. And if I I thought, okay, if I can return to that, that fearless state, then absolutely anything I experience is good, is exciting and interesting. So that was really powerful. So we're sitting there in, in the truck, and then um, eventually, after a couple minutes, the rest of the trucks pull in, and um, and one of the door the door on the other side of the truck opens, and I just lean forward and I said, "I'm okay. Get everybody else out." So I sat there for a few more minutes, and they pulled me out of the truck and and laid me down on the ground in the. They kind of pulled the trucks into a circle, like um, like a wagon train or something. <laughs> so they laid me down in the on the dirt, and I remember it, it was so relaxing. The dirt was warm, and the sun was warm, and I wasn't thinking at all about about being hurt. I was lucky because nothing was painful. I mean, that shock kind of knocks the pain out or something. I don't know, but but I was lying there just so feeling so good it felt so good to touch the earth to touch the dirt and then they came and got me and bundled me into a um another truck and all of us moved down the road a little way because there was a big crowd of iraqis that had gathered and they wanted to get out of there so they called in the helicopter um evac and they were on the radio <laughs> The guy in front of me, the, the, one of the guards, was shouting into the radio, we're at this position, you just passed us. And the dispatcher said, don't shout, stay calm. And he goes, I'm not shouting. Uh, I was laughing. Uh, so there was, you know, even, among, even in, within the trauma, I mean, I thought about that later too. Even within the trauma, there's always a little, there's always the little gems of humor and um and they're they're a big healer in and of themselves so we get there and um get to the next the good spot where the helo can land the helicopter lands and and uh you know dust just flying everywhere and two guys yank my door open and grab me by what got by the arms and just run me over the helo and the medic reaches down and he goes so how are you doing? Or yeah, how are you doing? And I said, well, I've had better days. <laughs> so I think um, you know it's interesting to me that I uh, and part of it could have been shock, but the whole experience was new to me. I mean, I'd never been blown up before, <laughs> and and in that absence of fear that I think really came from. Well, probably from the experience I talk about in the book, but also from, you know, that remembering the dream with my grandmother and um, that absence of fear allowed me to engage my curiosity and um, interest instead of, it never felt like a traumatic incident to me because of that, because I was fully engaged and interested instead of frightened. Talk us now through um, the, the weeks that followed and the healing process that you embarked on. And it, it seems to me this frame of mind that you were in, this incredible absence of fear, which is an incredible state to be in, and this playfulness and this childlike behavior, I think, may, may have set you up very, very well for healing. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it did. Uh, three days... After I'd been blown up, they flew me to um, the United States and took me to Walter Reed. So I was an inpatient at Walter Reed for um, the next uh, almost a month. Um, and that month was, you know, as you can imagine, I think I was in ICU for a week or something. I had, I had a hole in my skull and... Um, all the bones on the side of my face were broken and there was trauma to my eye that um, the retina came detached and, and I had a very painful um, right arm. Both, both bones were shattered in my right arm and I had a broken heel among all the other like 
bruises and cuts across my nose and teeth came out through my face and all that kind of stuff. But um, so basically I was a mess. But, you know, even within that, um, there was there was a lot to laugh about, you know, having a hole in your head is a great one for jokes. <laughs> and <laughs> so I think that you mentioned um, having like a childlike um, viewpoint of this and that I really did, you know, even there were days when I, I certainly was not pleased, you know, I was very sick from having surgeries one right after another that is the anesthetic made me very sick and um, one day I was in excruciating pain from um, my arm and you know it wasn't all roses but um, overall it was still I still had that childlike interest in what was going on I had never been blown up before I had never really had a broken bone before and you know thinking about wow, you know, I have a hole in my skull and I'm fine. Isn't that funny? <laughs> and, and thinking too, I, I had this, um, it's like an inner knowingness that if I knew that if I didn't worry about my body, that it knew how to heal itself. So that if I just relaxed and found whatever humor I could find in this and um, just allowed myself to indulge my own curiosity and interest that the body would heal. It would be okay. So I think that was, you know, again, that was probably partly a, a leftover from, from my um, experience out of body, but it also... Um, it was a leftover from that absence of fear. And, and I, at times I consciously maintained that absence of fear. I remember once sitting in the eye doctor's office and he was telling me that I maybe wouldn't really see out of my right eye again. And I started crying. And as soon as, I said, I'm an artist and I really want both eyes. And as soon as I said that, I, it's like it, there was almost a split inside me. It's like another part of myself said, um, was like, what is, what's your problem here? It's not, it's, it's not that big a deal. You know, this will be interesting too, seeing only out of one eye. And so there was still that joy and that interest and that curiosity even in feeling um, a little bit of anguish or a little bit of fear. So, um, and I think that I'm not sure how to cultivate that. I mean, I think I was very, very lucky in, in just sort of having that. And I, I think it can be cultivated. I think it can be learned. It's just a matter of, um, of, finding a different perspective and acknowledge the fear but but then say um even within this fear i'm willing to see this from a different perspective or i'm i'm willing to understand this in a different way just being willing i think opens a little gateway to a higher intelligence or a uh uh an inner wisdom that can transform your whole experience it's, it's interesting for me personally hearing the story because I too served in Iraq um, in 2003 and 2004 and I didn't have any physical trauma of any sort. But what I had was um, mental, mental trauma because we were getting indirect fire mortars and rockets every night and, and it put me in kind of a constant state of fear. Almost the exact opposite of what you're describing. No physical no, nothing touched me, nothing punctured my skin. But psychologically, I was in a constant state of fear. So when I came home from Iraq, I was never diagnosed, but I'm sure I had some sort of mild PTSD or uh, I, was, I had a very, very difficult time. So it's really, hearing your story, we had this kind of inverse thing, even though you're the one that was blown up. <laughs> <laughs> But your frame but I, of mind put you in such a different space than where I was at. 
Yeah, and I I experienced the same thing. The base, the first base that I was at, we were getting rocket attacks a dozen times a day, you know, and I was out on the road a lot, unlike a lot of people. So I was outside the wire. And that was, you know, of course, had its nerve-wracking moments. But, um, but I think uh, I have to say that that about three or four months after I got blown up, I, I started having those same kinds of hyper-alert um, symptoms. And I still have them sometimes. I, one example, <laughs> when I got out of the hospital, and I, I, had, I couldn't walk, and I couldn't see out of one eye, so I had a walker. You know, I was sitting out on the back deck, and um, this was in Maryland, Rock Creek Park right behind us, and it was winter, so they were shooting deer down there. And so I heard gunshots, and I immediately... <laughs> I was down on the on the deck, and I was I was belly crawling back into the house, <laughs> and I and I was laughing the whole time because I knew what I was doing was absurd, but I couldn't stop myself. And the same thing happened when I would I would walk down the street, and there was a piece of there was some garbage or a pile of leaves next to the road. I was on the other side of the road. I was not going to walk by those. You know what I'm talking about. I do. <laughs> I, I've often said whoever invented fireworks has never served in a combat zone. <laughs> Because they're not fun. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, um, I had a sense of humor about that. And I try to keep that sense of humor even now about that. Because I think humor is a great healer. It certainly helped me, you know, belly crawling back into the house, but laughing about it, being able to laugh about it. And saying, you know, that being able to laugh about it opened the door to me to be able to think about it instead of thinking about it only as fear. I thought about it as a habit instead that I could train myself out of. So, for instance, to train myself out of being afraid of the piles of leaves and garbage along the road, I, the, I made myself walk up to those things and touch them and like pick up the the Coke can and feel it and look around and say, now I'm here. That's great, Natalie. So I, I'm, I'm loving what you're saying. I think um, I, I'm a, a, a huge proponent of, of, of people focusing on their healing. And I, I see so often people, uh, soldiers coming back from combat, thinking that they're healed and they're not, and then they return. You know, so so what you talk about here is, of it being a process is is really mm -hmm. key, and that um, it's really amazing how you were forced yourself basically to face your fears, face the the, the leaves on the ground, um, and release that fear. And so um, the other points that you've had, you know, adopt a kind of. Um, a sense of humor. Um, see the see the the unknown in something. See the new experience. See the humor. I think is critical. Um, is there any other any other points that you can add that you would give as advice to others who might be going through some sort of uh, deep healing process? Oh, I'm not good at giving advice. <laughs> I know what I you know I know what works for me, but I think everybody is unique, and I I do think that. If you can um, find a little space of peace in trauma, that that people begin to find their own answers in, about healing themselves. We all have the capacity to heal ourselves. I really, truly believe that. And um, it's just a, you know, fear can be a great block. And you, for myself, I often, you know, I'm not, I don't try to stop the fear. I say. Oh, Okay, little fear, I see you are a big fear. I'm going to set you aside for five minutes, just five minutes. I'll be back. <laughs> and sometimes it's only one minute. But if I, can get, if I can just set that aside for one minute, it opens up a whole different perspective. And um, it often invites a piece in that, that then I can call on later and say, well, remember that? That's my real that." my real state of being, that peace. And if, I guess, patience and um, compassion for yourself and knowing it's a process and 
being willing, yeah, being willing to go through something instead of trying to resist it. I guess those maybe are the best I can do. <laughs> Wonderful. I, this is this has been a fabulous interview. I, I've I've loved your book. What the viewer, viewers don't realize is she, Natalie just told this incredible story, but she didn't even tell the absolutely otherworldly story that occurred to her, which is in this book. So um, she barely scratches the surface of what truly happened to her. Um, so I highly recommend everyone go out and grab a copy. Uh, it's available at Amazon.com, and I. Put a, I'm going to put a link to it in the P Sources page of the Shantapak web, website. And if you want to learn more about Natalie's writings and she writes on spirituality and, and other issues, I'm going to leave a uh, post to her website below this video. So, Natalie, thank you so much for talking to us today and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Allison. Thanks for inviting me. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to Shanti Pox to receive inspirational stories of peace. And remember, it's the little things you do in your daily life that adds greater peace to the whole. So thanks again. Bye. Bye. <laughs>